Uh, my name is Bevan Shimizu, and today I'm going to tell you about my design, uh, the title and concept of which is Wabi Sabi Water. And today I'm going to talk to you about four different things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is what is Wabi Sabi. And then after that I'm going to talk about the design of the garden I did. And within that design there's four different garden rooms. I'm going to go through each of those garden rooms and talk about the elements of Wabi Sabi in them, and then also the sustainable features that can be found in each of those garden rooms. So I, um, I read a book on Wabi Sabi, I watched an hour long documentary, I felt like I had it completely under control, and then last night I was reading it again, and I just read this thing that just completely changed my view of it. <laughs> but I'm going to do my best to try and explain a very complex, ever-changing concept to you guys. So, um, some things that can be used to describe wabi-sabi are imperfection, impermanence, um, the natural, the rustic, four seasons is a constant theme throughout wabi-sabi. Also, life and death and rebirth are all themes. Um, and wabi-sabi borrows a lot from Buddhism. Um, so, living in the moment and the meditation. <laughs> The meditative act of wabi-sabi is very important. Um, so the calligraphy you just saw me do here is an example of wabi-sabi. Uh, with calligraphy, you really just get one try at a stroke, because you can't go in and correct it, because you can see where the stroke ends and begins. So you take it for what it is, imperfection at all. Uh, so I'm going to go through some other forms of wabi-sabi um, to give you a general idea of it. Uh, haiku is traditionally associated with wabi-sabi. Uh, it's a very short poem, but it has a lot more meaning behind each, each of those words. Uh, there's usually a natural theme, and oftentimes there'll be a word in it that will uh, discuss or um, allude to the changing of the seasons. In addition, the tea ceremony is um, probably the thing that's most associated with wabi-sabi. Um, in the tea ceremony, uh, sometimes the host of the tea ceremony will make tea especially strong, so when you, you take a sip of it, it, you're really jolted by it, and it just brings you into the moment, and you're just like, wow, I'm, I'm drinking a really strong cup of tea, so you're not thinking about all these other things. Um, another element of um, wabi-sabi within the um, tea ceremony is um, the garden. As you walk through the garden, it's a big part of it and the changing of the seasons. There's different tea ceremonies depending on the season, so you use different types of tea and different utensils and different foods are served. Um, so gardens are also a part of wabi-sabi design. This is the most famous garden in Japan. It's called Ryoanji and it's in Kyoto. Um, it's at a Zen temple and really this is a reflective and meditative place. Uh, there's lots of different things that um, people say the rocks represent, but really you're just supposed to look at it and take your own meaning from it. Um, and so I've heard that some monks at different um, temples, what they'll do is they'll, it's a very meditative aspect, raking up all the leaves and the pebbles, and what they'll do after they're done taking all the leaves up is they'll, um, they'll put some back down because they know that there's imperfection and they can't ever have it perfect, so they're not even going to try to. So this leads me to my site. <laughs> my site is a blank slate as you can see now. Um, it's located in Cabin John, Maryland, uh, less than about half a mile from the Potomac. Um, it's a very, site very dear to me. My parents owned it and I lived there for two years in a house in uh, this back left corner which was torn down a couple months ago. Uh, you can see they're starting to excavate the, um, the footers for the house. I think the footers went in today. Uh, yesterday yesterday. So it's a really exciting project. Um, the house is designed, it's going to be LEED certified, there's going to be solar panels, um, it's going to be a net zero energy goal, and there's lots of interesting things that are going to the project. So I'm really excited to be working on landscape design. And in the design I did, there's, there's four different garden rooms. The first one I like to call Seed Head Meadow, then the Temporal Forest, Hackanokloa Falls, and the green carpet. So I'm going to go through my design and um, 
take you through each room and talk about um, the sustainable features of in, the, in it and then the wabi-sabi elements that I've borrowed to put in those rooms. So looking at the first room, which is outlined in black here, it's the sunniest area on site um, and it's filled with a lot of perennials. Um, the perennials will look great during spring and summer and fall when they're blooming. It's uh, almost, I think, 99% um, natives, so it'll provide a lot of wildlife habitat. And it'll look great when they're blooming, but it'll look very different in the winter because there's not a lot of evergreens. And so this is a picture of um, the High Line in New York City, uh, which is probably the most famous garden to be done in the past, I don't know, 10 years, it's debatable, but what Pierre Rudolf says about the winter landscape is that it's a very emotional experience, and it's a time when you can think about uh, decay and the cycle of life uh, within the garden. And so that's why I've named this garden Seedhead Meadow, because I think everyone can appreciate the flowers during spring and summer and fall, but during the winter you can there's a more humble type of beauty, but it's still there. And you can also appreciate the death and decay in the garden, um, which is always present. And that's a very Buddhist and wabi-sabi concept as well. Moving on to the next garden room, uh, it's called the Temporal Forest. And in this garden room, uh, like the name suggests, there's a lot of different trees. Um, one tree I'm going to highlight now, or a couple trees, are these two. And they are black cherry trees. Um, black cherry trees are native trees and they have a very high wildlife value uh, for lots of different insects and birds and butterflies. The one with the higher, highest wildlife value I also use are the white oaks over here. Um, but cherries are a very important tree in Japanese culture and also in Washington DC because we have our Japanese cherry blossom festival. Um, and so the black cherries are related to the Japanese cherry and they um, the moment when the Japanese cherries are blossoming um, is a moment where you're supposed to stop and go outside and, and take a picnic out with friends or family and sit out under the cherry blossoms and really appreciate that time like this guy is here. Uh, that, that moment when the cherry blossoms are falling on you, it really brings you into that moment. And so I think that's an important um, component to have in the garden so when you can really stop and appreciate it. Uh, but I didn't want to have that just in the springtime, so I also um, there, in the design, there's also some black gums, which have um, my personal favorite fall color. It's brilliant oranges and reds, so you can get that same type of feeling where you really stop and notice it. And both of these trees really show the changing of the seasons. Um, another thing in this part of the garden design is what I call the dry waterfall. So you can see this weaving through here. Um, down to the rain garden. And what the dry waterfall does is it takes all the water that falls on the driveway and that falls on this north side of the house and diverts it to the dry waterfall and channels it down to the rain garden. And so what this does is it helps treat all the storm water that falls on this side of the house on site and also highlights the wabi-sabi principle of impermanence because this waterfall will only be active when it's raining. So when it is raining, you, you can go out there and see it. Um, there is also a pond that's part of this, and this little section of it will be recirculating always, so that when you're on the patio and in the backyard, you'll be able to see that and appreciate the, the natural flowing water. Um, but when you put the rocks in, it's important to do it in a, in a natural way that can be aesthetically pleasing. Uh, so this is an example of a garden we did um, in Fairfax, Virginia, called the, at the Ikoji Buddhist Temple. And it's a similar type of feel that I'm going for. Moving on to the next garden, um, garden room. It's called Hakanakloa Falls. And here you can see a ribbon of Hakanakloa, uh, which is meant to mimic the flow of the dry waterfall. And Hakanakloa is a beautiful plant, um, one of the few non-natives that I have on site. But the reason I use it is because it has a wonderful flow to it. And it puts a movement in the garden, which I think is great. So it almost looks like water. It's like a plant representation of water in my mind. And I love the way it looks in the wind. It brings a movement to the garden, which I really enjoy. Another element on the side is the rainwater cistern. Uh, it's a big cistern, as you can tell. 
a 500 gallon cistern and what this does is it takes all the water on the south side of the house and it goes through the cistern and then the water will be reused on site as irrigation for the seed head meadow that I talked about earlier. Uh, so it's a great way to reduce demand of the city's water supply but also use the storm water that falls on site. Uh, the last garden room I'm going to talk about is the green carpet. And this mainly consists of a lawn area and a rain garden. And as anyone with lawn knows, to get a lawn that looks like this, it requires a lot of time and effort and water and fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides. So I think it's better to not even go for a lawn like this and embrace imperfection in the lawn, which is a you know, very wabi-sabi principle, and instead to have a lawn that is, can be organic and doesn't use as much water and doesn't use um, as many herbicides and pesticides and fertilizer and just embrace imperfection in the lawn instead have a green carpet. Uh, the other element in the garden is the rainwater garden. So the rainwater garden is a great way to treat the water that falls on site and to have it slowly percolate through uh, and that way be able to prevent uh, more water from going straight to the Potomac and the sewage system and help uh, treat it on site and filter it on site. So what I wanted to do, what the design wanted is a, a beautiful garden that's aesthetically pleasing but also being able to find beauty in different ways from the beauty of a seed head to the beauty of a site that's able to um, provide habitat and for wildlife to the beauty of you know, life and rebirth and death in the garden. Uh, but most of all, I wanted to create a site that, uh, where you can pause for a moment and appreciate the natural beauty of the site. Thank you.